Right, art fairs. I think one of the most memorable moments of a very memorable day yesterday was uh, when Mark Glimsher, um, director of Pace Gallery, announced that this conference should be a stop complaining moment in the art world. Uh, Pace Gallery does about 13 fairs and uh, he just wants to get on with it. But meanwhile, let me count the complaints. There are too many fairs. They're all the same. You never discover any new artists. And this is because smaller galleries can't afford to show emerging art at fairs because the price points are too low. And because smaller galleries can't afford to exhibit at fairs. And because people aren't visiting galleries. And because the internet is distracting people, smaller galleries are going bust. Yet, these complaints are all too familiar, yet attendance figures at the top fairs such as Freeze and Art Basel continue to rise, as does the proportion of the dealers, the annual sales that dealers make at these events. Last year, dealers said that they made about 46% of their sales at art fairs, 5% up on 2016. Overall, more than $15 billion of sales were made at art fairs. At the same time, for the first time in 10 years, gallery closures outnumbered openings. So I just want to ask the panel, panelists a, a simple opening question. Um, starting with you, Elizabeth. Why have fairs become such a force in the market? Um, I can speak primarily as a gallerist and uh, a founder of Independent Art Fair, which takes place in New York and Brussels. Uh, so we are a fair by galleries for galleries. So for, from the gallery perspective, fairs help accelerate the context and the pa potential patronage uh, of collectors for individual artists in a gallery's program. So that's a really key fact um, and a key aspect. So uh, what we wanted to see happen is, is developing a platform where uh, new collectors, or collectors can deepen and enrich in their understanding and experience of an artist's program and be able to really think through uh, the questions and, and for collectors to really identify artists um, in context to other artists and other programs. Okay. Christian, you, you represent a community of six, over 6,000 collectors. From the collector's point of view, why have art fairs become so important? For my, in, in my opinion, because there seems to be no alternative for the galleries, um, which is basically true until it isn't. Because I, um, in preparation for this talk today, I, I remembered when I started to collect around 12 years ago, there was one, just one principle. And you could say it was what you see is what you can get. Um, most collectors, I think, still follow this motto, um, either on openings in galleries or on, uh, on, at art fairs. When they go to an opening, they might find something they like and they might buy. But um, what, what became different is that I think especially younger collectors changed this kind of model a little bit and it's now maybe what you know of is what you can get. And that's interesting because imagine you see an amazing artwork by an artist you like or you even collect, uh, let's say on Instagram, maybe a snapshot just out of the, his or her studio. Would you really like to wait for the next gallery show or for the next art fair sure. to purchase it? Okay. Now, Mark, we, we had a couple of interesting conversations about time poverty being an important aspect of this. Would you like to elaborate on in terms of why fairs like Art Basel have been such a, a major element in the art market? I think the main reason why art fairs of the international level that we do are so successful is because they're, they, are, they drive patronage, as Elizabeth was saying, to galleries and to their artists from all over the world. Um, we drive patronage from all over the world to galleries all over the world. And that's our primary function within the art world, that we allow people to transcend their local markets. Um, to take it one step further, why is it that we can drive patronage? I think the answer is that we are the right mechanism at a moment when there are more and more collectors, 
but also where more and more of those collectors are actively building their fortunes. The notion that the collector is a man or woman of leisure who goes around to the galleries in their hometown and sees the things, to Christian's points, and buys them is not really in line with how things really work now. But I would say one thing, I, I, I agree with Christian in the sense that um, people do buy works that they haven't seen, but that is not necessarily what's going to be the thing that changes that there's no choice until there is a choice. Because the reality is this. A gallerist like Elizabeth is not going to sell an artwork to a collector she's never met if it's an artist who she values and it's a work that she values. In the same way that a collector is not likely to buy an artwork from a gallerist unless they've met the gallerist and they know the gallerist and they trust the gallerist. So where does that happen? Sometimes it happens in the gallery. Often it happens in the fair. Um, I watched David Warner's talk yesterday. Unfortunately, I was on a plane as it was happening. I got lots of text messages for reasons we'll discuss later as I came off the plane. But he talked about the we'll fair. We'll get on to David later, He talked actually. about the fair <laughs> as a souk. And I don't think that's true, actually. I think the fair, and I've thought about this a lot because I used to use the image of the souk. A fair is more like a department store in the sense that in a department store, you have many, many brands. And when you walk into a department store, you assume that those brands have been vetted. There's an assumption when you walk into an Art Basel fair, when you walk into the Independent, for example, that every gallery there has been carefully considered, and the artworks that are being shown are valid, are valid to be consideration, for consideration to be added into your collection. Okay. Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you about your fair, because your, your model has been pretty acclaimed, and collectors that I speak to are full of admiration for it. Um, now, Fairs are much maligned, many fairs are much maligned. What's it specifically about your fair model that you think is bringing, bringing something new to this particular debate in this context? I mean, I think it's coming again from the gallery's perspective of a fair's potential to make an impact, to broaden the audience for the artists. Um, and it's also about the potential to level the playing field in some senses. You know? And it just sort of, yep. your, your fair is run by dealers for dealers. That's an important distinction, isn't it? Correct. It was founded by dealers, and, it's, and dealers are at the core of our decision-making process. We decided to do a few things when we started in 2010. Uh, one was to uh, eliminate the corporate structure that ran fairs and to work with people who are working already in galleries. So our founding director, Laura Mitteron, was the director of Gavin Brown. So she simultaneously worked in the gallery and ran the fair at the beginning. Uh, we worked with Matthew Higgs, our founding curatorial advisor, to do the selection. Again, it was addressing a common complaint among gallerists about peers and or competitors uh, defining the f economic fate of other competitors in, on a platform and okay. whether that worked or not. We also thought about the ex user experience and the collector experience, and collectors were starting to feel fatigued by seeing the same galleries with the same rosters in the same positions everywhere. And the aisle system was basically an environment that was different than going to a museum and different than going to a gallery in the format. So the idea was that we would re discover uh, by putting the content first and to bring some of the culture of the exhibition making in the gallery to that platform. The other thing that was emerging in 2010 was the rise of the biennial as a production platform for galleries for their artists and also a sales platform. So we wanted to uh, develop an environment where artists would want to ha be commissioned for for this kind of okay. context. So it was several different things but it, in, a sense, in a sense it was about opening up the playing field and reaching a full potential of what the fair could become for galleries. Okay. Now, Art Basel is a, a department store on one level, but uh, I think a, a number of people felt that Art Basel Hong Kong this year did something a little bit more than a, a department store can do. Would, would you like to talk about that in terms of... I mean, to be clear, I'm not saying we're department store, I'm saying that we're not a souk, which is a different a distinction. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, you know, when people say what's the most amazing thing that's happened in your 10 years at Art Basel. There are many things, but I think being involved with the evolution of Art HK, which was a fair that was started by a number of British men um, in Hong Kong, and then tra the transformation of that into Art Basel Hong Kong as it stands today has been really an amazing process. Um, and it's one in which 
we worked very closely with all of the local stakeholders within the cultural sphere there, in which we've worked very closely with the galleries, in which we've come to know a region in a much more intimate way than we did before. And what's been fascinating about it is that while we originally thought about, and everybody thought about us building a bridge between East and West, you know, that Western collectors would come to Hong Kong and discover Asian artists, and that Asian collectors would come to Hong Kong and discover Western artists, we underestimated the heterogeneity of Asia. And I would say that Asia as a continent is the one that has the greatest diversity of colonial histories. They're both colonizers and, co and people who were colonized. Religious backgrounds, religious orientations, political structures, economic structures, the variety of ways in which galleries function within Asia is tremendous. From, from regions like Indonesia, where you almost have no galleries operating in traditional ways, to regions like Japan and Korea, which already, when we came to Asia, had the traditional structures of people having long-term. But also, did, did, in a very simple way, did Art Basel offer a, 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 a new collector a very efficient, time-efficient way of getting up to speed with what's going on in the international art scene? I mean, I think that's true everywhere, but with, with a special distinction in Hong Kong mm. that Art Basel Hong Kong is the only truly global world-class fair in the sense that it's, it's world-class. It has you know, about as many galleries as you would have in Miami or Basel, but it's one which has where half of the galleries are active in Asia. And what that means is that it's almost, it's, it's, I will say it is categorically impossible for someone to walk into that fair and feel a sense of deja vu from, the fairs they've, from other fairs that they've been to. Okay, okay. Christian, uh, in terms of experience, uh, a lot of people I speak to in the art world feel that going to an art fair is the worst possible experience you can have in the art world. But, there <laughs> but for you, uh, there are fairs that do things differently. What, what are you looking for with a good fair and an original fair? What, what, what do they bring to you as a collector and your, your fellow collectors? It's, it's, it's a bit funny, uh, it's quite funny that I'm sitting right here in between the two of you who are uh, representing, I think, two different kind of fair models. But from a, from a more strategic point of view, um, and you told me that, Scott, when we first uh, thought about this talk, that there are right now in the world 260 art fairs. Mm. So I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, um, for example, the, the three art fairs art, art, art Basel is uh, uh, organizing and doing, um, you won't have any problem in the, in, in the, in the long run and in the, in the uh, far future um, because you are the major player, Mark, and, and of course I'll be in June uh, at, at Art Basel. Um, it, the question for me is more what, what about all the others? Um, and and be, because if we think about whether uh, an, an, a system is broken or not, it's, we shouldn't focus just on the top 10 sure. of the, the best or the major players. And, and I think it's getting really difficult for all the others, but I'm not, I'm not blaming, for example, Art Basel, because you are doing a great job. I'm, um, I think the other 250 are in charge mm. to differentiate themselves, uh, themselves more from, and, and what I, from a collector's point of view, what I always see is they just copy the mechanisms, they just copy the processes, they come up with the same kind of VIP programs, and, and actually that's, that's a kind of boring. And mm. uh, I, I really uh, um, don't know why I, why I should put another art fair into my calendar besides, let's say, Art Basel, Independent and Freeze, for example, um, because there's no kind of different differentiation. Okay. So where essentially is the problem? I've heard again and again the phrase, the system is broken. Is it simply that there are just 250 too many art fairs? I mean, I think there are too many art fairs. Yeah. And I don't think that they have, I think Christian's right. I mean, what he's saying is music to my ears because there needs to be a compelling reason to create rich experiences that, that develop a community and an audience that targets a certain kind of continuum throughout the course of the year. You know, what fairs, fairs competitive advantage to the auction houses is the fact that we Yes, it is a buying event, and it is a four-day buying event, but there's also, we are building a community that can sustain galleries 365 days a year. And so how in which that is done, at a time where the market has grown so much in such a short period of time, 
there has to be a sorting mechanism that each platform provides or a perspective that helps the collectors define context for what they're looking for so that they can be much more efficient in space. You know, this isn't a mall in the 1970s where people are walking around staring at walls for six hours. You know, I don't know any other experience in the 21st century where people go into a space for six or eight hours to kind of wander uh, sure. in that sense. And I think that the scale uh, of the marketplace has become so overwhelming for so sure. many collectors that they need confidence. Uh, so branding can be one aspect of it, but they also really need the information to be accessible to them and to feel connected to it very quickly. And so our scale, I think, is one of our biggest advantages in that sense. Okay and our perspective. Mark, do you envisage, given the vast, I, we were talking about Miami, it's very interesting, during uh, our part of Miami Beach, you've lost count of the number of satellite fares. It's over 20 and still counting. Maybe one started as we're speaking. Um, do you envisage a, a process of, of natural selection here or um, winnowing out? I mean, two points. One is when I first got to our puzzle, there was a lot more concern within the community and, and within the committee of the fair about satellite um, fares. And I think at a certain point, there started to be so many of them that nobody, even the most FOMO, you know, um, OCD kind of person, wasn't going to try to see every fare. Mm -hmm. And so people actually started to focus, let's say, on Art Basel, NADA, and Design Miami, for example. Um, and I think if there's a winnowing, it won't be because the fairs are not successful. It's because the galleries, who are their clients, are not successful. Sure. I mean, you know, when you talk about the problem with fairs, I think the focus is a little bit too tight. I think you need to take the camera back and talk about the problem with galleries. Sure. Galleries today, and without the galleries, you don't have fairs. Galleries today are operating highly cash flow intensive businesses with collectors who pay slowly and cancel sales after fares when the opportunity has passed, and are generally unable to secure the kind of small business loans that other businesses of their size can do. And so if the fares have a process of, of elimination, the problem is that as long as there are galleries who do fares, who are there to do fares, the fares will be okay because the fares are a square meter business, you know, unless you're at the level where sponsorship and reputation really matter. Um, a friend of mine once said, the problem with fairs is they never die. They just agonize on their deathbeds. And they just get worse and worse and worse. But you can still sell the square meters up to a certain point. Okay. Christian, I, I, we're moving into a, a sort of fundamental issue here. Because again, again, people say, well, whatever the level of fair, when you go to it, you just don't discover new artists. And there appears to be a systemic problem that uh, galleries who deal in emerging art, the price points are simply too low to be able to pay, say, $80,000 to, to participate in the major fair. Now, for you as a collector, do you notice that it's art fairs, there's just there's very few interesting new artists to discover? I, I think so. So I, I, I remember pretty good the, the times when I started. I already uh, mentioned that I started collecting maybe around a dozen years ago. And of course, uh, when, I, when I bought my first artwork, uh, a few thousand euros or dollars still was a lot of uh, uh, money and a lot of, uh, still a high price for me. And we all get uh, more familiar the deeper we, we, we dig into collecting, I think. But um, from, I, I, I hear from a lot of, even especially younger collectors, a lot of times that somehow the let's call it the entry prices or the entry level, um, all, almost doubled over the last 10 years. Um, when, when I started, I, I remember it was, it was uh, pretty normal to buy a main work by a, by a young emerging artist in an emerging gallery uh, for, let's say, $10,000. And I, I can't find this price level anymore um, on the, on to nowadays. And, uh, doesn't uh, it doesn't is make any difference whether it's a gallery uh, show or at an, a booth at an art fair. So um, I, I think um, what what we saw over the last years that we we might we might did the wrong thing when we invited a kind of greediness into into the art world um, and we invited Freeness in what sense? Um, I, I, I think um, the, the 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 whole media 
the, the collector, a lot of collectors were so much focused on record prices and on um, what's the next big thing, often in terms of uh, what's promising the, the, uh, the best increase in value over a very short period of time, um, that, that this somehow um, moved our, our focus to a, to a point where where we lost a lot of potential collectors okay. who aren't in the game right now. And again, from a strategic point of view, it's always... Uh, let, let me stop you there. Let's move on to... Of course. Um, from the point of view, your fair, you, it's the independent fair. There's a, an implication that it's a, a new model, but it's in a, in a beautiful building in New York. And it's quite an expensive fair to, I think, booths cost well over $50,000. Uh, do, do you have that same problem that dealers really can't afford to bring as experimental or cutting edge works at lower price points because even at your fair, they're under financial pressure. I think there's financial pressure at every stage of, you know, of a gallery's life. And, and it really, until you get, I would say, you know, even in the top 10% of the market, you know, at a market fair, maybe that's, there's a different kind of um, stratosphere there. Um, but what I think is important that Independent does is it brings galleries from all these different positions together and it creates a democracy. Um, so unlike Art Basel or Freeze where you will have kind of a class system set up by the scale of the spaces, mm. there's radically large spaces and radically small spaces, we're trying in our fair with 50 to 60 galleries to minimize um, those um, large shifts. In okay. And so I think that is a way to address it. So, um, you know, I would say New York is very expensive, um, but it also is, as we just saw from the market report earlier today, uh, still, America is still the dominant marketplace currently. Okay. Um, so the depth of collectors is very strong there in a way that it isn't in other geographies. Okay. So it is, it's, it is a fair and it does have similar um, costs, but I would say one of the, all the costs that could be eliminated which are controlled uh, have been through the process of our organization. Okay. Now, Mark, I want to come to a, a, a sort of key point for Art Basel. Um, you might have heard that David Zwerner came up with an interesting suggestion mm -hmm. yes. that yeah. uh, he's willing to pay a higher uh, rent for his booth in order to subsidize uh, small emerging galleries, whatever. whatever. I, I, other dealers I spoke to said, yes, you know, I'm perfectly prepared to that. Are you amenable to this idea, the idea of sort of setting up a, a fund or higher prices for, for the bigger galleries to accommodate smaller galleries? Okay, so this is a highly complex question. I'm going to take a few minutes to answer it in depth because um, it deserves more than a sound sure. bite. Let's start with what David said, which is he's willing to pay a little more. Um, David's booth, although he didn't know it on the video yesterday, cost about $100,000. So let's say a little bit more is 20% more, right? So that's 20,000 bucks. That's one statement stand. Um, the problem is that in principle, it's great. I mean, from our perspective at Art Basel, as long as the square meters are paid for in a way that we can show a decent profit, it doesn't really matter who's paying for it. But the question is how many galleries at the top of the market are willing to subsidize the rest of the fair? Because it's too simplistic to say that it's the young galleries who are struggling. The reality is, if you look at New York, the closure of Andrea Rosen has a much bigger impact than the closure of real fine arts. The closure of Martin Klosterfelder and Johanna Kamm and Gitti Norbach has a much bigger impact than Mickey Schubert, although all of those were galleries that were in Art Basel. Can so I the point is... There for, but, but I, sorry, I, think I, of, I think a lot of collectors, when they go to fairs, they want to discover a young, fresh, fresh yeah. artist. I understand the problem with mid-sized galleries, but we're talking about smaller galleries with those small price points. But I'm talking about the whole ecosystem. Okay. And the point is, Yes, if, the, if there's a, a, if a, we already do subsidize the younger galleries in the sense that they pay much less per square meter. In fact, we dropped the rates a few years ago. They've creeped up a little bit. But the point is that it's not much more expensive, if at all, to do the younger sector of Art Basel than it is to do Lista if you're an established gallery, or than it is to do NADA, for example. But galleries do, I've spoken to plenty, and they, yeah. and they say they struggle to 
pay for this. I, the, oh, no, of course they but yeah. they struggle to pay for it at any fair because it's, the fairs are an expensive way to sell okay, art. Can, uh, can I come but, on? But, I mean, but okay, to, come to come to your basic point, we have no issue with the idea of trying to work more closely in terms of helping the younger galleries of the fair. But the way to do that, the algorithm, as Mike has said before, the algorithm for figuring out how to do this is difficult to reach. And the question of how much and how many of the dealers at the top of the game are willing to do this kind of cross subsidization is the thing. Because I know this, we spent about a year and a half devising the art market principles that we issued last year. You, if you make a change to the system, it has to be one that is seen as fair by the people who are affected by it. Okay, okay. I have to interrupt you because we're, sure. uh, with our other points. Well, what about chucking some more money at this problem by charging wealthy collectors to go to the fair? Because at the moment, if I'm an art student, I have to pay 40 Swiss francs, which is more than to go I to MoMA. I think we have a student discount, actually, but anyway. Hmm? I think we have a student discount. That's but, it. I've just okay. looked it up. It's 40 yeah. Swiss francs, which is a lot of money for a student. We also give a lot of, of passes away for, for okay, to schools Okay, but it is, it is, it, it is ultimately yeah. one of the great absurdities of the art fair system is the wealthiest, wealthiest collectors pay nothing. Mm -hmm. And that the general public, for want of a better term, has to pay very more than it costs to go to a great American museum. Yeah. Why not charge some of these wealthy collectors to, to contribute to possibly this notion of subsidizing emerging galleries? It's an, it's an interesting idea. Um, I guess the question would be how much would you charge them and how many of them would be willing to pay for it? Because as far as they're concerned, they're already contributing a lot to the gallery system. I mean, you could do a system where you could charge people a kind of deposit, and once they spent it at the gallery, then they would get that deposit back, perhaps. But um, it is an interesting question. You know, how can the collectors who benefit the most from being part of the art world, at a financial level, generally, um, contribute more to the galleries. And I, don't, I, I would frankly rather see collectors going to buy more art at young galleries than paying more to enter the fair. Okay, can I, just a, 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 a factual point, would you actually consider coming up with some kind of, what we call, I don't know, subsidy system to, to, to to make it a little bit easier for galleries at the emerging level? Would you seriously consider it as well, a fair Well, we've done it in the past by reducing the prices of the younger, the younger um, okay. galleries, but it's something we consider constantly. We have a committee which is drawn from the selection committees in which we develop these, in which we discuss these big systemic issues, and this is one, one of the questions. One of the problems is that the cost of doing a fair is not only the cost of doing the booth of paying for the square okay. meters. Is, is, that also, is that, Mark, is that a yes or a no? <laughs> the answer is yes, and the okay. answer is we Good. have, and we consistently discuss it. And okay. the question That's... is that we're not just trying to address the issue of the youngest galleries, we're trying to address the whole issue, because the biggest problem right now is that mid-market galleries are sure, struggling. Sure. That, and that's, in a sense, a separate conversation. Okay, so final point before we move on to, to questions, and I hope there might be one or two, is that this entire discussion, in my mind, certainly brings up the, the, the question, who are art fairs for? Who are art fairs for? Well, I just want to, may I backtrack to, sure. I wanted to, um, just on, on Mark's point about how to address the disparity in, um, in the system and to help subsidize the, from the grassroots level sure. galleries. Um, after David made that comment mm. yesterday, I called the teams back in Brussels and New York and I said, if this were us, how, do we, how can we formulate it? And we ran some numbers and I just thought I would share it to the audience. Oh, this is where our scale can be an incubator that might inform, or a laboratory that might inform the larger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we have 50 to 60 galleries. If we were to um, ask 10% of those, which is, by the way, five or six galleries, and we are not at the price of our Basel. We are, because of our efficiency system and our scale, we're able to be less booth price. So let's say it is, you know, a 40 or $50,000 booth. Um, you know, if they were to pay 20% more, that would still be, you know, four to eight, maximum $10,000 more. That's a drop in the bucket for many of these galleries. And you're only asking four or five of them 
five or six of them to do it. And would it make and, a significant difference? So then we took that calculation, um, this is New York, uh, and then we went and said, okay, let's distribute that evenly from the bottom up, mm. from the smallest stands up. What kind of overall percentage could we, and how big of that percentage of remaining galleries? We could give 12.5 to 14% discounts on almost 40 to 45% of the state remaining stands. Okay, so it's a runner. So this is a very simple calculation that okay. we did. And you're going but to it, do it? And we are very happy to do it. The other thing, but by the way, we've been talking about this for a long time with the galleries about how to do it. And that is one way. Another way, which might also work, is to have a venue tax for each gallery. So if I have a gallery in New York, Hong Kong, or Beijing, and I'm taking one stand, uh, maybe there is a venue tax. So for each venue that the gallery has, you pay a flat tax or a percentage more. Okay. That's another way that it could be a little bit more democratic without having to have uh, you know, 50 galleries buy into a concept in order to help a fair that has 300 galleries. Great, okay, fascinating. Questions? Over there? Have you, have you ever thought of uh, allowing museum professionals, curators, directors, a little bit of a head start when the fair opens? Because, you know, we're not such fast runners and uh, it would be interesting to see it, what would happen. We know artists like to have their works in art museums. So either you could do uh, a clause that says that no private collector can put anything on hold or buy anything in the first hour because that would give us, you know, museum people a little bit of a head start, or give us an opportunity to spend 90 minutes at the fair before anybody else arrives. We can't compete with the money, and we certainly aren't that fast runners. So <laughs> maybe you can give us an edge. Mark, what do you think of that? I, I'm going to assume the question was for me, not for Elizabeth. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, you know, she could answer it as well. No? Okay, I'll Either take way. It. Um, I mean, obviously, first of all, I think it's very clear that the preferred sale in most cases is to a museum because museums very rarely sell work. Um, and in terms of building an artist's CV and their, you know, and their standing and their, you know, their long-term position within the canon, the museum is the place you want it to be. Um, I'm not sure how we would implement that, and I'm not sure that the galleries would necessarily welcome it. Um, and in the end, we have to think about our clients. You know, what I w the other th complexity is, what do you do with someone who has a private museum? Because they're both a private collector and a museum professional. Um, and what do you do about the museum professionals who serve as advisors for so many private collectors? I mean, this, this is, you know, if you ask the question, you're going to get the answer because it's a complex thing. Um, I mean, any gallery, you know, the thing is, you're in touch with galleries ahead of time. Right? And you can tell them to, to hold a work in the same way that a private collector can. So I don't think it's a question of when you walk in the door. The big problem for museums is lining up the funds to secure a sale for a gallery that's trying to, you know, whereas you, you, have, you can't do impulse buys, generally speaking, as a museum, unless you have a predestined budget to spend at a fair. Um, I think the logistics of that proposal are interesting to consider, but probably impossible to implement. Okay, we have another, may, another sorry, question over there. I'm not sure if it's a question to the panel only or also to the organizers, but um, while you uh, state the absence of new models in, or concepts in the art fairs and these new art landscapes, I, it rather seems a question of perspective because they do exist. I've been to the Philippines, Art Fair Philippines, for example, where every hour of these five-day event is like Basel Basel in the preview time, you know, like buying and frenzy and everything. Same yesterday on the panel uh, in Asia, a uh, question came up, uh, what are the new art frontier markets? Indonesia, Philippines have been mentioned. I guess, or, like my experience here is rather that these areas, markets, ideas, concepts, new formats do exist. They have just not yet been uh, represented either in this panel or in this, uh, in this summit. So, so uh, what's your experience with these, let's say, new areas, art fairs, others? There's Indonesia, Art Jog, for example. They organize artists because there's no infrastructure, no museums, only collectors and artists. They organize their own fair. These are smaller but very vivid and vibrant areas. And as 
overall market, as you know, uh, Basquiat had been bought in Indonesia 10 years ago already. Many of them, you know, they exist there. So, so um, basically, what do you all do uh, to embrace and also uh, make this a real, how do you say that, global market and include these new beyond emerging already areas? I think this is an opportunity to to realize that we are in a shift between, we're living in the 21st century and we're dealing with a model that is from the 20th century. And so we're trying to take things that are working and take things that are feel a little dated and reimagine them. Uh, so there's so many ways in which that can happen. I think we have a massive opportunity to, to, to do that in formats that are a little bit more um, dynamic, uh, that take into account the priorities of live experience, uh, to think through what the next generation is going to want to consider a cultural experience, uh, how we connect them with new artists that are uh, in development in terms of the public consciousness, and how do we develop a snapshot of our time. And I definitely agree with you, Matthias, that we have so much to do. I think we're at the beginning of a really dynamic period where we can reimagine things for the future. Uh, and I think the geography aspect of that is going to be a critical component to how we move forward. Elizabeth, talking of time, we've run out of it, I'm afraid. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, there's a, a lot, yeah. lot more to discuss. Thank you so much, Thank you. Uh, my panelists. Yeah. Thank you.